Hello everybody, my name is Luis Escobar. Um, this video is the introduction to epidemiology. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in fish and wildlife conservation at Virginia Tech University in Virginia, the United States. Uh, the classic definition of epidemiology is that this is a field that studies diseases in populations and the factors that are behind the presence of a disease. If you are familiar with epidemiology, maybe you are familiar with this map. This is a classic map of the history of epidemiology, which was made by uh, John Snow, which we consider the father of epidemiology. And basically, he was um, mapping cases of, cases of cholera in London and here in the map, we see that every point is a case. And using this map, he was able to identify a cluster of cases um, around a pump uh, to have access to water. And after the, remo after the removal of that pump, the epidemic um, was, was controlled. So this shows that identifying where diseases occur can help us to uh, interrupt the transmission if we identify the factors behind uh, transmission events. This is Wu Zhoukei, who we consider is the father of, uh, the grandfather of epidemiology because um, around uh, three centuries before John Snow, Wu was already um, mapping diseases and estimating potential number of cases by season and working with potential factors of infection in soldiers in China. Uh, so here we have two uh, key actors in the development or the establishment of uh, epidemiology as a field. So I had the opportunity to visit the area where the uh, cholera outbreak happened and I have been following epidemiology methods and, and theory for the last 10 years. And something that I see in this theory is that many analyses of epidemiology, for example, are based on the original ideas of John Snow. Here I show the map. And I, I show also that um, we are using more modern techniques of GIS. For example, to do fast analysis and more accurate analysis to identify the factors behind infection. Here, using a GIS software, we can see that we can identify the exact pump uh, where most cases were concentrated, which took John Snow several uh, weeks maybe to identify. Here, we can do that in seconds. Um, but the original idea is that there, there is no much progress in how we map diseases because we are using fancy tools, but we are using the same methods that John Snow was using uh, more than a century ago. So this map is the cases of rabies in Bolivia. And here you can see the number of the concentration of cases across time from few cases to many cases. But again, here we are using, we, here we see only the density of cases, right? So one concern is that we don't know if it's maybe uh, a scenario where we in the 2000s have less surveillance and now we have better surveillance. Maybe we have more data because we are doing better research. And actually maybe this is the situation that things are not changing. It's just what is changing is our a effort to do better research. Um, this is another example of cholera. Um, and here you can see that, again, we are identifying densities of cases to identify where we have more risk compared to where we have less risk. One of the problems of using these methods is that when mapping diseases based on densities or clusters, we have the assumption that the landscape is the same, the behavior, the income, climate is homogeneous in this 2D area, and that the health care access is homogeneous, something like this, where we have the same conditions everywhere. In reality, we know that that's not true. And that, uh, here I'm, sh I'm showing 
a study I made where we have the number of samples uh, across municipalities. And in red, I have municipalities with, with a high amount of cases or samples. And in blue, I have municipalities with a low amount of samples. And in yellow, I have municipalities with uh, an intermediate amount of samples. So using that information, uh, let's imagine that now I, can, I want to estimate the amount of cases of infection from those samples. And maybe I have a, something like this, um, but there is a municipality for which I don't have data. So when we use the classic methods that we use in special epidemiology, like trying to do interpolations, density analysis, cluster analysis, I'm going to try to fill that gap based on the information of, if I don't have data for one municipality, I take information of the neighbor municipalities and I make an inference of that and I fill the gap. So this is the result from my model, but maybe in reality, the real amount of cases is higher. And maybe I have more cases there uh, because the uh, health system is, is, is bad. And maybe because the health system is bad is why I don't have enough samples from that municipality. So we still use these methods based on interpolations, for example, for trypanosomiasis in Africa, that is a vector borne disease. Um, so in this case, what the authors did was to estimate how much, uh, how long a, a, a vector can fly to estimate uh, the risk of transmission around that area. So we, they were able to make maps identifying high and low risk based on that information and ended with a map like this showing areas with high and low risk of transmission. But uh, if we analyze this with detail, especially for West Africa, something we can see is that there are areas with very low risk or very high risk, but also there are areas where we have no, no information. So what we need to assume is that maybe these are areas with no risk at all. And if there are areas with no risk because we don't have cases from there, maybe we should not be concerned about transmission there. But I'm confused because maybe we don't have data from these areas, but people travel to the uh, centers, the, the big cities, to have the uh, medical treatment, for example. So we, we are hiding information because we don't have samples from those uh, white areas. Um, and maybe those areas that are in blank are areas that are of high risk, especially because we don't have data for those populations. Um, and we are receiving the wrong message that there is no risk. And if we send that message, the people um, uh, actually could be uh, in danger of transmission. Um, so now what we are proposing is the use of many uh, environmental variables that can give us some information of how is the landscape, because maybe there are some factors behind transmission. And for that, we are using ecological niche theory that is from the field of ecology. Uh, and we're going to explain that better in the following uh, videos. But the idea is that we take information from these uh, environmental variables using GIS software to identify which factors consistently explain the presence of, uh, of transmission. And with that, we can then make maps of risk. So this is a revised version of a special epidemiology, um, which is a branch of epidemiology but especially epidemiology focuses on the geography of cases, where we have um, uh, cases, uh, where we don't have cases, and why we have that difference, which can be used uh, to manage diseases and allocate resources. Uh, examples include, for example, the a hotspot of transmission, which can be done at the global level. Uh, this is one example of emerging diseases globally 
This is another example of infectious diseases globally, especially from wildlife. This is another example for a specific disease um, where authors were using several variables. And this is another example for Ebola in Africa, for which the authors were using information of the wildlife reservoirs. So these tools can be used um, for many, many infectious diseases to identify what environmental factors are related to transmission. So if we, under, if we understand the biology of infectious disease, the wildlife reservoirs, the landscape where the disease is happening, maybe we can do better maps um, of a transmission risk. For example, instead of having these maps of Zika virus transmission, for example, at the global level, uh, we can take into account um, a climate. And here we see that maybe Alaska is not a good area for mosquitoes because Alaska is with snow most of the year. Um, so if we take into account climate for the mosquitoes, we can have a map like this one where we have more detail, a, a more information about the seasons. We think about the biology of the mosquitoes, the biology of the pathogen, the biology of the wildlife reservoir, and then we can have uh, more information of where we can get transmission. And this was the introduction to epidemiology. Um, um, see you soon.